Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us tonight to gather together in this place as your family to study your word. I pray, God, that you'd bless those who are gathered here. I pray, Lord, that even this study tonight would remind us of those things that we hold true and dear to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I did something like this <clears throat> with the ethics class when I taught for jury. And I made the statement that the Apostle Paul teaches us more about ethics than anyone in Scripture except Jesus Christ. All the lessons that Jesus taught, how we are to live, what we are to hope for, what we are to expect, how we are to interact with one another, how we are to interact with God, all the lessons that he taught, I believe Paul deals with in his writings. You've heard me say before, the book of Ephesians, I feel like for me personally, along with the book of Romans, probably give us the greatest collection of doctrinal teachings that we are to adhere to. I believe that all the major doctrines of Scripture are covered or mentioned in the book of Ephesians along with the book of Romans. Particularly the book of Romans. It is an epistle that Paul wrote as many of you know while he was imprisoned under house arrest <clears throat> Romans in Romans Paul defines the doctrines of the church very fully I believe he gives us a picture of what Christian theology really is now I'm going to try to be brief I'm not going to keep you real long on Sunday nights and obviously I'm hoping for more folks to come on Sunday nights. I applaud you for being here. But we need to invite other people. We need folks that don't normally come. We're, we're actually down tonight and I, I don't make excuses for nobody. You're here and I'm thankful for it. Sometimes I wish we paid to come to church. That way we'd all be interested in what was going on. Amen. And we'd want to get our money's worth. Right? Come on, y'all lighten up. Really? I got to tell the students at Drury, y'all have to sit and listen to every word I say. And I love it. I said at church, sometimes people go to sleep. And I can't say much about it. Throw a handkerchief only so far. Y'all saw that this morning. That was my extent. I said, but uh, I'll just come back in and get in your face and wake you up. And I want us to take a lighthearted look, and I, I don't want to preach to you every night and pound on you every night. I just want to point some things out and, and hopefully give us some handouts, much like you see right here, that will just help us, give us a guide. I encourage everybody, lost or saved, if you're going to read the Bible, read the Gospel of John and read the book of Romans. And then complement your day with a psalm, or a proverb and if we can get folks to read the Gospel of John and the many facets of the life of Jesus they learn about Jesus they learn about his mission and they learn about the death the burial the resurrection they read the book of Romans they, they get great doctrinal teaching and obviously the Psalms are meant 
to remind us that God is with us in the valley. Amen. That we ought to sing and shout. That we ought to be happy. Those who have trusted in Christ Jesus for salvation were never meant to live defeated, disparaging, gene, boxed in, unhappy lives. Amen. In Romans 5 and 17, Paul writes that the abundance of grace which we have received and the abundance of grace which we receive every day along with the gifts of righteousness enables us Paul says to reign in life through Jesus. In other words, God wants us to have an abundant life and He wants us to allow Christ to work within us that we may live prosperous life. Now I realize that when we study Scripture we learn of the thousand year millennial reign which we studied in the book of Revelation and there will come a time when we reign and rule as it were on earth with Christ and then for all eternity we will be with Christ but there is truth in the reality of the fact that Christ wants to reign in your life he wants to rule your life he wants you to allow him to rule your emotions he wants you to allow him to rule your will he wants you to allow him to rule your willpower we are royalty along with Christ. The Bible teaches us that we are princes. We are princesses. The theme is taught. I mean, we're a royal priesthood of God. And because we are part of this royal priesthood, I believe that we are expected to understand what is expected of us by God. The book of Romans and the doctrine of Romans deals with every major ethical choice that you will ever have to make. If you want to have good ethics in your life, then study the book of Romans and study the book of Ephesians and you base your ethics on the teachings of those passages of scriptures. Now, <clears throat> I presented this and we went through the different chapters as an overview of Romans and we took a little bit of time just about every night to look at a different chapter of Romans along with all the other stuff that we did. And we had some healthy, almost heated debates between the students about their ethical approach to life. I said, made the statement, according to the teachings of the Apostle Paul, which is what we are to base our theological beliefs upon, our ethical beliefs upon, we will, through these teachings, we will find the right side of every position that we are to take. Does that make sense to you? All right, good. Paul's epistle to the Roman church is an important follow-up to the multitude of historical facts presented in the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. Paul's epistle to the Roman church is an important follow-up to the multitude of historical facts presented in the four Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. When we understand that the Gospels are a historical record of the life of Jesus, when we understand that and we study those closely, we will see how he responded to different situations which you and I must respond to every day. Every day Jesus made an ethical choice. Now, if we understand the teachings of Scripture, Christ was God. He was 100% God, and yet Christ was 100% man. He was humankind 
though he was divine. As students of Scripture, we understand that Christ, <clears throat> the Son of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and God the Father, as the three parts of God are relayed to us in the Bible, had a meeting one day in the eons of eternity past, before the creation of man. It was discussed and it was decided that God would create man with the freedom of choice. All of us have been given the freedom of choice. God decided that He would put inside of every person that has ever been born a sense of morality. We call this a moral compass. We make our decisions based on the moral compass that we follow. Amen. And so Christ, Holy Spirit, God the Father, understood before the creation of man that giving man the choice, the moral choice to do what's right and what is wrong, that eventually he would choose that which is wrong. And thus we have the story of the first book of the Bible of Adam's decision along with Eve's decision to disobey a direct command that God gave them. Now I explained this to the class by having them turn to Genesis and I recap for them the story of Genesis creation. In that account it says, And God said, God referring to God the Father figure, let us make man in our image. That passage of Scripture is where we find that God is saying, let us give him a moral compass. Let us give him the ability to choose, the freedom to choose. And so man from that day forward and everyone since then has been given this freedom. Sometimes we choose right, sometimes we choose wrong. Thus, in that eons of eternity past, God, knowing that He would give man free choice, that man would choose to sin, had a plan by which He would restore mankind to the kind of relationship that we were created for. I told the students the story of the reason God created Adam was to have fellowship, someone with whom he could commune and extend his favor so that he could reveal himself unto his creation. He then created Eve, not from his feet so he could trample over them as you hear at weddings, not from his head so that he could make them feel inferior as if he were the smarter sex, but from his side, so that he could walk side by side with his companion, and together they could help one another with the decisions of life. And so when you begin to explain these things to a group of non-believers and believers, knowing that they have to listen, <laughs> because they know that I'm going to test them, you can always relate what Paul knew and what Paul was trying to present in his writings as working in creation, the story of the Jews, and so forth, and so on, and so on. And so it's important for us to understand the history of the Jews. You see, Jerry, he still has uh, the two-week study we did on the history of the Jews that we did on a Sunday night. And I encourage you then and encourage you now, you ought to have a copy of that. You really should. Um, but when Paul wrote to the Roman church, he reminds them of historical facts. He focuses on uh, historical facts that were found in the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. And he builds on those, as it were. As the first doctrinal book in the New Testament, Romans reads like a first century court in biblical 
theology as the first doctrinal book in the New Testament. In other words, this book is full of doctrine as we've already covered. Romans reads like a first century course in biblical theology. Theology simply means teachings. The teachings that we hold dear. The teachings that we think are important. Everyone has a theology. Every person in here. People who have never come to church. Uh, they have a theology in life. At the core of the curriculum is the central attribute of God. What do you think is the central attribute of God? What do you think that, that, that the number one attribute of God, what is God? Well, one word. God is love. What else is God? Is God holy or unholy? Is God righteous or unrighteous? Paul repeatedly teaches us about the attribute of God, which is righteousness. You see, God's righteousness made it possible. God's righteousness is made possible through the living, resurrected Christ. The only way a person can become righteous in the sight of God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what Paul was teaching, and what you need to understand in life, you need to understand it for the test. I gave four big tests. You need to understand it for the test, but more importantly, you need to understand it for life. Because this is the most important thing you can learn about eternity. Whether you believe in it or not, someday you'll find out that it's real. The righteousness of God is made possible through the living, resurrected Christ. Because Christ, as the Gospels teach us, and Paul continually reminds us, allowed himself to be crucified and took the punishment for our sin, even though, as we see in the Gospels, he lived a perfect life and did nothing that was worthy of death. We, on the other hand, as Paul will teach us, and as you know, being students of Scripture, we do things every day that are unworthy or uncomely in the sight of God. There's where Paul tells us that we're all sinners, and the only way that we can be justified is by grace through faith. Justification is by grace through faith. It is God's grace, unmerited favor, that He shows upon us, that He places in our lives, that He bestows upon us. It's His grace, it's His grace that we obtain through our faith in the story of the gospel. And therefore, that's how we are justified. At this point in time, I would generally stop and say, do you understand what I'm saying? Would you like to comment on that? Would you like to discuss that? But you're not paying for the course, so y'all just listen. Amen. The word faith appears 55 times in Romans. We all have faith. A lot, if not most, of our faith is oftentimes misplaced. But we all have faith. I have faith in my wife. I have faith in my friends. I have faith in the church. I guess I got carried away with this being my church is our church, amen. I'm just excited about our church. You know, hey, I don't really care what everybody else is doing. Let them do it. We're gonna do what we do for the glory of God. We're not in competition with anybody. But you can't always cooperate with everybody either because they won't let you. Y'all say, man, you know what I'm talking about. The family of God. Nowhere in his other writings does Paul extol the fatherhood and family of God as he does in the book of Romans. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I love that song. 
You all know that that's a song that we as Christians like to sing. And Connie, you'll be proud to know that I did my very best at singing every word I knew of that song. And invited some of them to join, and some of them did. By the way, both times that I was allowed and asked to teach this course, by the way, I don't think I'm going to again if I'm asked. Both times, God used the teachings to lead someone to Jesus. And both of those people followed up with a local pastor somewhere, wherever they lived. And I followed up on them. And they were baptized. And the last I checked, both of them were part of the church. And I still have these, well, they're youngest to me, but you know, they're not really youngest. They still come in the store with questions. And I still answer them, amen? And you would too, if you were given that opportunity. We have to teach them that faith is important in our life. So that no matter what the circumstances that may come our way, we can stand strong knowing that God is with us and that we're part of His family. And to understand that God portrays Himself as our Heavenly Father, these kids, you and I, I was very fortunate to have a daddy that was saved later in life. But some of these kids don't even have a father figure in their life. They don't understand what a father figure is supposed to be. Or they've had an abusive father. In Romans, it deals with Israel and the Gentiles. I have written down Israel's temporary disobedience toward God had resulted in something most Jews of that day would not have predicted or even conceived. Because they were God's chosen people, God showed them favor. They almost got the big head about it. To the point that they looked down on outsiders so much that outsiders were turned off by their attitude by the time of Christ. They would not have predicted, they did not conceive that God would be merciful to the Gentiles. You will find as the book of Acts is closing, Paul is saying to the Jews, you've rejected the message in large, by and large. Now some receive. You, you've rejected your Messiah. Thus you've rejected your Savior. And so I am taking this message to the Gentiles. For God has ordained me to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And they're going to receive. And we've all been given the commission to make sure that lost folks hear about the gospel of Christ. I've written down living in the world. This is another topic that's dealt with in Romans. Chapter 13 contains the New Testament's longest instruction about Christians' relationship to civil government. Civil government. Living in the world. Now, we've got an obligation that goes beyond grumbling, griping, and complaining. Say amen. We do have certain responsibilities that come with living in America and not taking our liberty for granted. It was a great conversation we had about the place of government in our everyday lives and the laws passed by government. You can imagine some of the avenues of discussion that that led to. Heated discussion. But I like a healthy debate between lost folks and when there's Christians in the room that will stand their ground. I loved it. Chapter 14 lays out significant guidelines related to matters of choice in life. I began tonight by saying that God created us and He gave us a choice in every matter of life. And God wants us to choose to live the abundant life and the joyful life. And He teaches us how we can. We're going to move pretty quickly now. Almost every chapter of this epistle deals with a number of great theological issues. Big word, theological issues. What do the terms theology and theological, what, what is that speaking of? Somebody tell me. I've already told you. What, are the, what does that mean, theology? 
What does it mean? It means God's teachings. It means teachings. Theology is teachings. We are studying Christian theology. Nearly every false religion has some set of guidelines that uh, proponents of that faith are expected to follow. And almost every, well, almost all of them that I've ever studied have some resemblance to the Ten Commandments, leaving out the first two. They deal mostly with the relationship between others. And so about every world religion gives you a set of ethical boundaries of how to deal with life and how to deal with one another. But only Christian theology gives you the absolute proper perspective when it comes to your ethics. Amen. Almost every chapter has a doctrinal theme. And so I'm going to ask you, I might go a little longer than I promise because it's already almost 20 till. But I want us to look at the doctrines that are presented in the passages that I've listed down here that deal with them. And I've tried to make it very simple. And if you've got an outline in the Bible, probably it, it, it was going to be similar to this. At least I would hope. Let's start by reading chapter number 1 and verse number 4. And let's together see if we can find what that verse is dealing with. Who wants to read that? Well, go ahead and read. Just go ahead and read the first four verses. All right. What is the key topic there in verse number four that he is speaking of? It is the foundation of our faith. What is it? Christ's deity. Okay. Give me, give me another one that I'm looking for. What about what proved Christ's deity? What was the one event? Exactly, the resurrection. The one event. That he proclaimed himself. When you see this happen, you will know that everything that I've told you is truth. And so the resurrection was absolute proof that Jesus was who he said he was. And seeing the proof that he was who he said he was. Seeing what no one else had seen. How could you not give credence to what he taught? Amen. Amen. In verse number 3, Connie, you've already given the answer to number 2. Turn over there to chapter number 9 and let's look at verse number 5 and see what it says. Chapter number 9 in verse number 5. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Just start with number 3 because that's where the sentence starts. Accursed. Accursed from Christ for, for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who were who are Israelites to whom to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promise. Of whom are the followers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternity. Eternally blessed God. Amen. Amen. That's talking about Christ's deity. Paul very clearly, time and time again, teaches that Christ was deity, that he was God. Now, I read over some of the claims that other false leaders have made throughout time and they even some of the things that they had heard from maybe not their religious teaching that they had had but just different things in life um, 
about their leaders the, or who Gandhi I got quoted Gandhi a lot all right I got quoted a lot of Gandhi and so forth and while some of what they said was true you know what in the end Gandhi's still in the grave his body is his soul is somewhere amen he didn't resurrect he didn't claim that he's going to resurrect some have claimed they did and then when they didn't you knew they were liars amen all right chapter 8 and verse 3 we, it was dealt with as well in in the verses that sandy read chapter 8 verse number 3 who would like to uh, read that Now, I might ask you what that's talking about, but I'm going to tell you for the sake of time. It's talking about Christ's humanity. Christ's humanity. In that indeed, He did become a man. And we've already talked about He being fully God, and yet He was fully man. But when we say that He was fully man, that means that He felt the type of emotions that we feel. He was weary. Uh, he was tempted. He was tried, most certainly. He was thirsty. He was aggravated. All the things that we deal with, His humanity dealt with. And therefore, studying the Gospels and seeing how He was tempted and tried over and over and over, we see how He responded to those trials and to those temptations, and He becomes the example of what we should strive to be. Go back to chapter number 1 and let's read verse number 17. Somebody different. Now, I'd like for everybody to read something tonight. Okay, what's the word, word, answer, one word answer that that's dealing with? Faith. Faith, 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 faith. The just shall live by, say it with me, faith. This is a perfect example of how you can take a passage of Scripture and share it with someone and ask them what is it in life that you trust most. You'll get some very resounding answers. I mentioned I trust my wife. I trust y'all. No. I trust that when I turn the light switch on, the lights are going to come on. Huh? I mean, I put faith in that. I just take for granted it's going to happen. Right? If Karen pays the electric bill. If not, I'll go out and sit on the deck. I don't care. Read the next verse. Whoever read 17, read 18. Going down to 24. Read that as well. Judgment. Say it with me. Judgment. That's the issue with which is being dealt here. It's easy for us to judge one another. I would normally say, give me an illustration of how you've been judged in the past. And eventually someone would say how they feel like they've been judged. And then I would ask the question, how do you judge someone else? Do you truly judge someone else the way that you want to be judged? Because that's a part of your ethical behavior. Amen? Do you judge someone the way that they would want, the way that you would want them to judge you? Because that is a part of your ethical behavior. Judgment. The most famous passage in the book of Romans probably is Romans 3 and 20 through 23. It's a great part of what we call the Roman road. And as Christians, we all understand what that's talking about. That's talking about sin and depravity. The consequences of sin. The wages of sin is... Okay. 
deprived of eternal life. Sin deprives us of eternal life with Christ. That's what Paul is teaching because that's what Paul knew that Jesus taught. And remember, Paul had a meeting, a council, if you will, with Peter and sat down with Peter after Paul had been saved on Damascus Road, after he had gone out three years and communed with God, communed with Christ. He went to Peter and told Peter all that Christ had revealed to him and he asked the details about Christ's life. Which stands to reason that Paul never met Christ personally in the flesh. But he did meet him in the spirit after the resurrection. As you continue chapter number 3, verse number 24, all the way through chapter 5 and verse number 2, Paul deals with the doctrine of justification. And I like that word and the description that preachers always use. God looks at us just as if we had never sinned. Justification. Chapter number 5 continues. Verses 10 and 11, we are introduced to the doctrine of reconciliation. As I have already explained and as you already know, reconciliation is possible again because of what Christ did at Calvary to reconcile us to the fellowship that God wanted to have with Adam and Eve. The reason for their creation was so that he could commune with them and show them his love and show them his favor. And that's still what God wants for us today. And so Paul teaches the topic of reconciliation. The thought of reconciliation will greatly determine your ethical behavior because it deals with forgiveness. Are you willing to forgive? Give me an illustration when you've had to forgive someone. Now, did you forget about that as if it had never happened? You see, then I can explain to them, well, the Bible teaches that God chooses to forget. As Brother Marvin was saying in Sunday school this morning, God chooses to forget your sins. Amen? You have been reconciled. You can, and by the way, the key element of reconciliation is the blood that was applied to your sins and my sins. Yes, Christianity is a bloody religion, for without the shedding of blood, there would be no Christianity. And then if you continue chapter number 5, verses 12 through 14, again deals with sin. S-I-N. What's in the middle of that word? I. I am the one who chooses to sin. No one can make me sin. I have the final authority. I have the final choice in everything that I do. Even if I have a gun pointed at my head and someone says, do this or die, the choice is still mine whether to do it or whether to die. Moving on, if you continue chapter number 5, chapter number 5 is loaded. In verse 15 through 21, I believe that very clearly we find the doctrine of grace and eternal life. And again, without the grace of God, He would not grant you eternal life. And that's talking about eternal fellowship to be with Him for all the ages and ages and ages and eons of ages that will never end. Grace and eternal life. The Gospels all tell us in Jesus' words how we can have eternal life. Whether you believe in eternal life or not, according to the teachings of Paul, and that's what we're studying, Paul says that you can't have eternal life. And again, he bases that on exactly the teachings of Jesus Christ himself. Chapters 6 and 7 deal with sanctification. The fact that we are sanctified, set apart from the world. And we understand as we read those chapters, as we understand in life, the process of sanctification is a continual occurrence in our life. Because the more that we choose to separate ourselves from the 
things of the world, the better off we are. If we choose to engage in the things of the world, Ernie, then the worldly pursuits will keep us from the right relationship with God if we allow it to. Amen. I mean, having stuff, having a lot of stuff is not a sin. How you use that stuff can be a sin. Having lots of money is not a sin. How you use that money can. Having a, having a lot of knowledge. And people say, well, you smart aleck know you all? Know it all? Well, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, you're sitting here tonight because you want to know more. Huh? But how you use that knowledge, you're accountable to how you use that knowledge. And we, if we want to be the person that Paul is exhorting us to be, then we need to understand that we need to separate ourselves. We need to make choices in life that give us the best opportunities in life. And those ethical choices are not always easy, but those are the choices that separate us from the world. You hear me? It's all part of the process of sanctification is the choices that you make and that I make. In chapter number 8, Paul deals with the security of the believer. I am safe and secure in Christ. And you can imagine the discussion that you could have with a room full of believers and non-believers mixed together about the security of God. I'm going to let you down eventually. I'm going to do something that you're disappointed in. We all let one another down. What little bit of money I have, I'm putting it in the bank. The government tries to assure that my money is secure. They're going to stand behind it. They're going to keep it safe. The truth be known, I don't have a lot of confidence in government. <clears throat> I would bury my little bit of money in the backyard, but I'm afraid the dogs would dig it up. I'm just making sure you use it. We are secure in Christ, and that's one of the that is the main reason why we can rejoice, as I started out this lecture tonight, to have that joy, to rejoice, to have that confidence, is because we know that we are secure in Christ. And that's a teaching of Paul. Because that's a teaching that Christ made known. When he prayed, Father, those you've given me, I've kept. You study his prayers. I know that you will keep those who come to me. We are secure in Jesus. We'll talk a lot about eternal security. Chapter number 9 deals with the election. A great big topic. It's a big word. It's a big thought. Basically, the election is this. God has chosen to save you if you choose to be saved. And he knows those who will choose to be saved before he gives them a choice, and yet he still gives them a choice. Are you confused yet? Then we'll talk about elections some more later on. And then chapter number 14 is one of my favorite topics, and it is the favorite topic of all Christians. It deals with the second coming of Christ. It also deals with the judgment of believers. This is where I took the opportunity to explain to them that Scripture teaches there will be Two judgments. And I asked the class, can anyone name and distinguish those two different judgments that we will face in the future of eternity? One of those is the great white throne judgment. Christians will not be judged at the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment takes place in some point in eternity future where God brings before him in whatever grand arena of space that he wants to all of the loss of all of the ages and he shows them their works and he shows them you could not do enough good to outweigh the bad that you have done therefore you are going to be eternally separated because of your sins and because you chose not to receive my grace. Now Christians are going to be at that judgment. And you know what's going to convict us? The opportunities that we did not take to try to influence them with the gospel. 
or to try to influence them with our lifestyle. However, we are already eternally secure. In fact, we have already been judged at the judgment seat of Christ, which, if you were here for the Revelation study, occurs after chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. And then I said, for a study like that, you just need to come to Abounding Oak Church on Sunday. Amen. Romans also contains some of the keys for the spiritual life, the reality of sin, and the extent to which it has damaged our lives. Keys for the spiritual life and the reality of sin. Sin harms and hinders and hampers our spiritual life and our spiritual growth. Therefore, we must make good ethical decisions when it comes to life and how we treat those around us so that we can avoid sin, so that our spirit can grow closer to God. And by the way, a note you could put on the back. The Lord Jesus appears in almost every chapter of Romans. In fact, the Lord Jesus appears nearly 70 times in the book of Romans. Now, if we were doing a study of Romans... We would, look, which we've already done, by the way, on Wednesday night when we first started together. We would examine a chapter of Romans every night and find out these things to be true. But let me say again to you, the book of Romans is, along with the book of Ephesians, is probably what I have found the richest books when it comes to doctrinal Christian theology. So I'd encourage you to study the book of Romans. And as we go through our course that we've entitled Christian Theology, we will deal with each of these as we progress through this. And we will look at other passages of Scripture that complement these teachings. Do you